How's it going, peeps? Welcome back to Viva La Coin. I am Joe. I will be your host for today's episode. And if the sound is still a little bit messed up, I can find this balance somewhere in between jet engine loud and just a uh, graveyard quiet. So I apologize about it being a little bit louder, a little bit lower on certain videos. I'm still trying to find that balance. I think it has something to do with my mic picking it up differently uh, when I reset everything each time. Um, but hey, you know what? You live and you learn, and I appreciate you guys nonetheless. But what I want to cover in this video is two parts. One, I'm going to touch real briefly on some news that came out about uh, certain payment companies such as PayPal and uh, what they're doing in crypto and why it's so important and why I believe other large institutions uh, will follow suit. And then the second part, I'm going to be breaking down some on-chain data that shows us the behind the scenes of what's going on currently in the cryptocurrency market, what's going on with the bull run. And I know that uh, instead of coming on here and just saying like, oh, let me talk about this one specific crypto or this one specific update right now, that still isn't going to benefit anyone because everything is tied to Bitcoin. If Bitcoin plummets, the rest of the market is going to plummet. Um, we still haven't broken away from that. And that includes Ethereum being the second largest cryptocurrency. It still has not decoupled itself from Bitcoin in the market. So when you have this divide, it, when everyone's talking about it, I, I don't care if it's in the news, on crypto Twitter, in your friend group, uh, where half the people say, well, based on my technical analysis, the bear market is starting and we're going to drop. Or you have people, hey, based on my technical analysis, we're just going to go to the fucking moon. All the new people are just going to pick their sides because they don't understand the difference. And then everyone else in the middle just feels less and less confident about their own decisions. So I'm just saying, let's look at the numbers. Let's see if we can extrapolate any assumptions that we can make, or at least what are the probabilities of us continuing to run, uh, to run up, or does it look like everything is going to break down? So I'm going to be covering that. Of course, if you have any comments, concerns, just want to say hi and help me out with this YouTube algorithm to get more people on the channel, um, leave a comment down below. I'm always happy to touch base with you guys. And um, ultimately, if you want to follow my Twitter, it is just at VV, uh, Viva LaCoin BTC, Viva LaCoin uh, BTC. So you can go on there. I'm always tweeting about the stuff going on throughout the day. Uh, but let's just jump into the stories themselves. So the crypto market right now actually isn't looking as bloody as everyone expected it to. Everyone was calling an extended Memorial Day weekend, massive future expirations, and all the fear and doubt and news and bullshit that came up to this point it was going to plunge us well below that $30,000 mark and people are still calling for 20k per bitcoin and below. Now, at a certain point, you have to accept the fact that the bull run might be over. I by no means am here to spread hopium as they call it. Um I, me just saying things go up only doesn't mean anything in the short term. Although we know where bitcoin and crypto and blockchain is going to lead us into the future, the short-term day-to-day price action may not always reflect uh, its overall value and the disruption it can have to every current industry sector on the planet. So when I cover this, including that Twitter thread that's going to break down all the different examples, it's going to have uh, the sources that they use to cite these different charts. I'm going to include that Twitter thread and a link to it down in the uh, bio of this video. I recommend you go and check it out, but they also say the same thing at the top. Like, look... I might be wrong. Nobody officially knows, uh, minus the people behind the scenes pulling the strings. But what we want to try and figure out is how can we make the best decisions currently to not panic or, or sell low and also to not ride the market all the way into the ground if it were a bear market. But first, let's look at just fundamentals, right? Because I mentioned that the fundamentals of Bitcoin and why it is valuable and why people want it, both the scarcity, the immutability of it, the incorruptibility of it, uh, the total n number of people adopting it, and the, its permissionless nature, essentially. So anyone can use this network, unlike most banks in the world where you need a certain amount to be in it. They can shut your account off. It, it, it never ends. So those fundamentals haven't changed. So if we look at the world and how businesses and billionaires and other people are reacting, they're still buying in, regardless of the price being down. And I'll show you some of that data here in a second. But one of the biggest things that came out was PayPal um, came out and they said that we will now allow people to buy, hold, and sell crypto with PayPal. 
So this was a problem that I had with apps such as Robinhood, where you can go in and buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, fucking Dogecoin, whatever you want to buy with them, but you don't actually own the crypto. It's essentially just buying paper crypto. You can't transfer it to a different wallet address. They haven't sent you the cryptocurrency. You do not own those private keys. You've just purchased whatever value amount of that crypto is in there, but let's say it goes up 10, 10 more times and you go to pull it out, you can't pull that crypto, you have to sell it, creating a taxable event, and then you just get that money. So these different companies know that they need to be able to, in order to compete and to stay relevant as crypto grows, they need to be able to offer the actual crypto assets to you. And that's what a bunch of the banks, including Wells Fargo and BNY Mellon and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and all these people are trying to purchase crypto for. So that when they offer it to their clients, they're offering the actual cryptocurrency assets or they at least have it backed if individuals want to withdraw. So they announced that they will now allow you to do this through PayPal and by extension Venmo. Um, and this is big for a couple reasons. So one, it's going to increase the amount of cryptocurrency that PayPal needs to hold. If they are w going to sell cryptocurrency to you, uh, and you can download it from the fucking app. They're going to have to own it first to then sell it to you. So that's the first bullish item to come out of this. Any company that intends to offer cryptocurrency in the actual asset form, they're going to have to buy it as well just to maintain that liquidity to sell that crypto. Now, on the other side of the coin, these are all businesses. So their competitors are going to have to keep up with this model if they want to stay relevant or compete with a service like PayPal. And go figure, literally two, three days after this announcement came out, um, it was just announced today that Coinbase, uh, they're going to have a debit card. Uh, so it's now going to uh, incorporate and work with Apple Pay. So the integration brings crypto exchanges heavy reward spending tool to iPhones of US users. And that's big for a couple reasons. One, it's already been speculated that Apple was going to get into cryptocurrency at some point in the very near future. Uh, it isn't on their financial reports that they put out yet this year. But if your competitors, such as PayPal, are going to start doing this and other competitors will follow them, you're going to have to integrate it. And earlier this year, I put out on my Instagram, my social media, that the Apple wallet itself is already being looked at to be able to receive cryptocurrency. So the more they incorporate with Apple Pay and the more PayPal leads the charge to drive that, the more excited I get about the adoption of crypto in general. Now, the other piece of news before we actually look at just the on-chain data was I've covered in a couple stories when we talk about FUD or that fear, uncertainty, and doubt that countries have tried time and time again to ban cryptocurrency. And India has been one along with China that just banned it for the 18th millionth time. Um, India continues to say that, oh yeah, it's banned. And then as soon as you get some momentum, they ban it again. But these bans never go into effect because you can't shut something down that you can't control. So it just came out that India's central bank, RBI, confirms crypto banking ban, quote unquote, no longer valid. And they ask banks to stop quoting it. Now, you would ask, how, how could international news uh, still be saying that India banned crypto when this seems like pretty simple due diligence to look into it and figure out what happened? Well, it's because they do it intentionally to put it out there to create fear in the market. But what wound up happening was Indian Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, or RBI, has officially advised banks that its banking ban circular uh, is no longer valid, as it was set aside by the country's Supreme Court more than a year ago. More than a fucking year ago. This was already set aside. The fact that this was even in the news, that they banned it again, just shows that we live and eat and breathe headlines and we don't actually read the news that comes out we don't check additional sources we don't do our own due diligence we just jump into that fear and the whole market reacts so they said it's come to our attention that through media reports that certain banks or regulated entities have cautioned their customers against dealing in virtual currencies by making a reference to the rbi uh, circular dated april 6 2018 so before we move on to the next thing, I just want to take a deep breath in. 
and just breathe all the bullshit out because this is the same garbage that they're going to continue to do to help really tilt the scales um, in their favor when they're manipulating the market or driving that price up and down because it's going to scare new people out of the market. So this Twitter thread is put up um, by a guy just goes by Phoenix, but it's uh, Phoenix underscore Ash 3S. Um, just put it out today, and it's a lot of data and on-chain uh, on analysis, which is a little bit different than just price action or your technical analysis when you're breaking down charts of where things are moving. This has more or less to do with who is holding crypto, how long are they holding it for, uh, have we hit certain metrics that show that the market is overheated, um, is there something that is broken down in the charts that might uh, denote that we're moving into a bear market. So he breaks this down, and I do want to highlight again because I cannot stress it enough. Uh, he even said, I'm really bullish, and I do not, or I do think this bull run is far from over, yet we have to take in mind that it could be. Um, he could be heavily wrong uh, about the current state of everything, so please do your own research. And I'm going to use that um, option right here to jump in and say, don't forget, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an oracle, nor am I a fucking wizard. So always do your own due diligence when you're going into this stuff. I can only provide like a little bit of uh, I, an idea of some of the things that I look at and some of the, the things that people much, much smarter than me um, look at when they are determining what is going on behind the scenes. So in the first couple, he does break down, hey, here are the reasons why we're bearish. He talks about the, the China fund, about them blocking it, breaks down all the typical technical stuff, showing, oh yeah, you know, our next level of support is 20K below that 200 um, day moving average that we dropped below and all that information. Um, that's not what I'm looking at because I believe that dip was fabricated using that Wyckoff method. And if I just look at those technicals when they're saying the volume's low or people are too afraid to be in the market, I disagree. And that has to do with how many people have hold, um, held through that and who sold and how much did they sell. So a couple pieces of data just to look at in this dip. So when we have um, an all-time high of uh, unrealized, or sorry, realized losses, which was on May 19th. So that means that mo more people sold and they lost money than ever before uh, in a single day. So in, actually in that week, there were $14.2 billion worth of realized losses. And that just means if I bought Bitcoin for 60K and I sold it for 30K, I would have 30K worth of losses. So the charts showed that those losses were combined across several different coins. Now that drop is also, um, sorry, this drop meant also a drop in realized cap. So after a long and steady rise from the start of the year, um, but when they talk about realized cap, that is just the actual all-time high of the market in the crypto assets or their net worth and not their market value. So really, the actual crypto that was sold, not the numbers and all the derivatives and the garbage that can manipulate it up and down, but the amount of crypto that was sold uh, declined only by about $7 billion of just actual value, um, which to me doesn't seem as extreme as those 52, 53% dip charts that you see people break down. Um, he breaks down a little bit of the fear stuff, but I, I'm not going to look at that. I want more or less like what's going on in the data itself. So this answers the question of who sold. So who, who sold? Spent output age bands show a large portion came from new holders between one to three months um, old because you can tell the age of a wallet in the blockchain uh, network, which is good because with blockchain, everything's transparent. And um, also three to six month old owners. So that makes sense. There are a lot of newbies that got scared, not the bash, just facts. And that is the truth. So hopefully my face isn't blocking uh, the bottom part of this chart, but when we look at the age of the wallets that are selling, and it's the older the wallet, it's more like black, dark purple, looks like brown, all the way up to um, white, which is brand new wallets. So most of the spending that was going on over the course of that dump was coming from new wallets. It was significantly higher uh, than what the typical baseline spending is. 
So a lot of people were selling in those new younger wallets. And part of it has to do with there just isn't any education out. So they see a news story like that bullshit one about India from two months ago. Oh, they're banning it. No, they're not. They weren't going to and they tried in the past and they couldn't. Um, so what about the people that aren't new to Bitcoin? Well, this graph shows um, wallets that have been around for one to three years. Um, so that's the last cycle and those people that bought back in 2017, 2018. So they were way more certain that this wasn't the macro top in general. They held strong and sold their coins earlier, um, a little bit higher towards the top if they were to sell. So they actually did some capital rotation earlier um, in the year during this cycle as we moved into this. But they haven't sold a lot of their uh, coins in their wallets up to that point. And I, I can speak for myself. I didn't really sell anything um, for the most part. I mean, I rotated a couple things around. A few other people in the Telegram group went through last cycle as well. They held. Um, a lot of people didn't panic. But um, so now about unrealized losses. So those are the people that are underwater. So let's say if you bought Bitcoin at 60K and now it's 30K, but you didn't sell, you were at an unrealized loss because you still have the crypto, but if you sold it, you would be X amount under that, that level. So do we need to expect more panic selling in the coming weeks? So 9% of the current market cap is an unrealized loss. To compare, March 2020, it was 44%. And in November 18, at the bear market bottom, it was even higher. So for the most part, uh, in, I'm, I'm going to try and move myself over just a little bit so that I'm not blocking this at all. Um, so there are very few wallets comparatively to the last two major, major crashes or corrections that we had that are in unrealized loss. So most wallets that are left are at about break even or they're still in profit. And that happens because the more Bitcoin and the crypto market progresses, the more people that have held for three to four years, those people are in profit. The people that held for seven years, they're even more in profit. It's going to take a lot to shake those people out of the market. And that correction that we just recently had wasn't going to be it. So it is not likely that we're going to see a ton of people that are losing more money um, panic sell if we don't break down further than we are right now and so far those supports in resistances are holding up uh, at least for the moment so then going back to the new pool which is a metric i covered on here before so that's net unrealized profit and loss that's pulled back to uh, a much lower mark so 0 0.5 i'm not here claiming to be a statistician or a fucking mathematician so bear with me on this so this level has acted as support many times in previous bull runs and currently was untested. So we, we haven't gone this low in this new bull metric throughout this entire run. And all this does is it shows how many wallets are still left in profit or how many are out of the profit. And we got incredibly close to this overheated blue euphoric uh, sign. We crossed it twice in the double peaks of the 2013 bull run. We blew off top once we moved into that euphoria stage that blue uh, line around end of 2017 into 2018 and we didn't cross it this time we got close but we didn't cross it and now we went back just like in the previous bull markets we touched it once twice three times four times in 2013 into 2014 touched it about four times once we broke above a certain level in 2017 18 and this is our first touch so we're not overheated to the extent that everyone's in profit and we're, we're just at the point where it's all unrealized. So then everyone panics and tries to pull it once so they can take that profit once the market starts to collapse. There was an increase in exchange outflows as well. So just as many people when they were putting in coins in order to sell them, there were also increases in exchange withdrawals as well. So it was pretty balanced. It, unlike what you would see in just the overall market cap. You would think that just everyone sold and it would just be a straight down line and no one was buying, but they were. There were actually plenty of metrics that other people were breaking down from Glassnode or CryptoQuant that showed that the number of whale wallets, any wallets that were over 100 Bitcoin up to 1,000 Bitcoin, 
they were actually increasing over the month of May as opposed to decreasing because those coins that were being sold, they were going from weak hands to strong hands. And I showed that metric on my last video where it was about $20 billion worth of Bitcoin were purchased by new people in the market, wallets between one to three months worth of age. They sold it uh, at around 55 to 60K. And that same amount was purchased by long-term holders, people that didn't sell, around the $30,000 to $35,000 range. So that will continue to happen regardless of if the numbers, the day-to-day -day price action, action shows it. So you can see on all of the different exchanges, the um, total amount of Bitcoin available is still going down. You don't see a massive inflow where these start to reverse and then all of a sudden there's like four times as much Bitcoin available. Um, that number is still going down. Just because the number is down currently, that does not mean more Bitcoin is available. And we just go back and we think about the stock to flow model when we talk about um, that price action following the scarcity of it, right? Supply and demand. Um, it, he breaks down a couple charts about Binance, how Binance added more Bitcoin, but that was people selling in order to use the Binance smart chain. Um, was talking about futures interest in derivatives, massive uh, blow off top there. So derivatives are just when you're essentially using a multiplier um, to long and short different positions that you're in. And to be honest, if you're doing that in this market, you were probably one of the multiple people that got completely fucking crushed. Um, and lost a ton of money just because it's been so volatile. So of all the derivative open interest that, that's out there, we had about a 60% drop in it, which is good. If we could wipe all of it, I'd be even happier. I think it's um, definitely unhealthy the more bullshit that you have going on with leveraging. So getting a lot of that crap and a lot of the meme coins and new people doing all that stuff, wiping all that from the market too, it stung a little bit for newcomers, but it had to happen. The market was incredibly overheated and it was not healthy. So that was just some of the stuff that was going on currently. And he breaks down a bunch of previous uh, information as well. And I'll cover just a couple of these that I think are uh, relevant. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with too many charts, but he was breaking down uh, Bitcoin's previous all-time highs. So in 2011, which was the first ever bull run, after it broke all-time high and there was a blow-off top, there was a certain amount of days that passed and then it eclipsed that old all-time high and ran up to the first of two tops. So that took about 273 days before the total market topped at the second one of those peaks. Now, you fast forward from 2013 and when that peaked out, it was 252 days to the top after breaking all-time highs. Um, 2017, I mean, it was 252 days. And right now, we're only 161 days into price discovery. So with this massive correction, we still have room to go. We're not overheating most of our metrics. And the market was already stretching way too high on the stock-to-flow model, which even the lower band still has it right around $30,000, $31,000. But we were already, I think, $12,000 ahead of where we should have been. We were up at like sixty-two k where the average was showing we should have been around fifty. dollars um, and then was breaking down different percentages of all time highs. There were a couple other things I wanted to show. Um, so the stock to flow model has an average heat map, which as you can probably assume, I didn't write this fucking equation, but really the more overheated the market becomes, uh, then you start to see on, on this chart, it'll start moving from blue into orange into red. Uh, so we haven't even moved into orange yet. So we are not overheated. Uh, on the 200 week moving average um, to where we should have had a full blow off top and an end to the run um, in really anyone's opinion. Um, you have, I'm trying to think of a, a couple ones. So stock to flow. I mean, we already covered this, but simply put, um, Bitcoin is scarce and limited in supply, more demand, less outflow due to the halving, which means half the amount of Bitcoin can be mined every block that's produced every four years moving forward. So the number will continue to go up. And typically it overshoots at the top of each one of these cycles. We barely even crossed the line, let alone far overshot it. And then goes into a couple more holding patterns and different things like that, which 
again, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not going to sit here and bore you with the, the important concept here is I want you to keep asking yourself the more that you learn, did the fundamentals of what cryptocurrency is or what it does change? No. Um, are there are still institutions, regardless of them saying, oh, institutions aren't getting in. They all sold and went back and bought gold. No, they fucking didn't. And there's still going to be more adoption that we're going to see over the next six to seven months that is going to affect the trajectory of this run. And then on top of that, if you're in the United States like me, uh, we just had an announcement of an, a new $6 trillion budget uh, announced for not so much stimulus, but just more spending, more printing, more garbage from our end that's going to continue to print the dollar into oblivion. And it's going to continue to um, really weaken uh, our monetary system. So I think that all in all, when we look at the, the on-chain data, we know that it was mostly new people that are selling. We know that it was being manipulated in that Wyckoff pattern, and they dumped it down. But then those same whales bought more at the bottom, just about as much as all the new people sold from the top. We know that adoption is continuing to occur, and we know that we pretty much bottomed out if we look at a bunch of the backtest metrics, such as that Nupal rating, uh, retesting that 0.5 level, or if we look at a bunch of the metrics that had to cool off, they're pretty much lining up with what happened previously in the in the last runs. Now, my personal thought is I still want to see us stay low just for a bit. And I'm not talking like low, like drop lower. Uh, I still think that we could have a swing low down into the high 20s just to really drive that last stage of panic and capic uh, capitulation. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that we are at a point where... They are reaccumulating on that back half of the Wyckoff um, pattern in that reaccumulation phase that I showed you the last time. And I think that with EIP-1559 happening with Ethereum, Taproot happening with Bitcoin, Cardano's main net going live, Polkadot, Parachains, and everything else that is just about to occur, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me if the big money and the smart money is still accumulating and none of our main metrics are showing that anyone that's holding the majority of the crypto is selling, but in fact accumulating, um, I would be shocked if the run just continued to fizzle out from here and we had three years without it continuing to resume. But I'm open to any contrarian opinions or any questions about that down in the comments below. So please uh, leave those and share this with anyone else that may just want to look at some of the data or even go one step further and click into that Twitter thread because... Again, I'm not a mathematician. I can't sit here and give you the full in and out of every single chart, and there was still like 20 more to go. So I want you to have access to that and actually look through it yourself and do your own due diligence and feel a little bit more confident in the decisions that you make. Aside from that, as always, I am honored to have you with me on this episode of Viva La Coin, and I will catch you guys next time.